Six years after Vanessa Marcotte was killed, the man accused of brutally taking her life admitted to the crime. To so much as alleges murder in the second degree, how do you plead guilty or not guilty? Guilty. This video discusses events that occurred in Massachusetts. On Sunday, August 7, 2016, 27-year-old Vanessa Marcotte visited her mother, Rosanna, in Princeton, Massachusetts. She typically had an active life, going for walks outdoors and doing yoga, so on that sunny and warm day, she decided to go for a run. She had a bus ticket to travel in a few hours to New York City, her home and place of employment. Vanessa went for a run and never came back. Since Vanessa was not normally acting this way, her mother, Rosanna, was worried about her daughter's extended absence and called the police for assistance. Since this kind of incident had not occurred in Princeton, a tiny town, for 30 years, the case received great attention from the national media. Furthermore, 30-year-old Karina Vetrano, a fitness blogger and runner, was involved in a comparable event in a New York City neighborhood only a few days prior. On June 17, 1989, Vanessa Teresa Marcotte was born in Leominster, Massachusetts. She did exceptionally well in school, earning a bachelor's degree in communications with honors from Boston University in 2011 and graduating summa cum laude. After graduating, she began working at WordStream, a Boston-based business that developed internet marketing tools. Later, she worked as an account manager for Google in their New York City headquarters. Vanessa could visit her mother and aunt, who lived in Princeton, a small rural town with 4,000 residents in another state, roughly once every two months. Since she was the only child in the family, her mother, Rosanna, eagerly anticipated each encounter and was pleased when her daughter could pay her a visit. Vanessa went for a run on Sunday, August 7, 2016, at about 1 p.m. from her mother's home on Brook Station Road. Later that day, she took the commuter bus back to New York. She knew exactly where she was going to run. When hours passed and Vanessa didn't return, Vanessa's mother called the police. Authorities launched a search as soon as possible, initially focusing on the vicinity that Vanessa's trip roughly followed. About a mile from Rosanna Marcotte's residence and roughly 60 yards off the road, the search team reached a densely vegetated area at 8.20 p.m. when a police dog followed the track. Someone found and promptly identified a woman's body. It turned out that Vanessa Marcotte was the victim. Detectives had no doubts after a preliminary investigation of the body that Vanessa's death was criminal in character. She had been completely naked, and her hands, face, and legs had minor burn marks on them. Clearly, the location of the body's discovery is fairly remote. Only the road and the forests on each side are present. No dwellings exist. Additionally absent were Vanessa's headphones and cell phone. Despite a comprehensive search of the entire vicinity, police could not locate any of these things. Because they might have left his DNA traces on them, investigators thought the culprit had taken them on purpose. Beside the corpse, on the grass, lay a shoe that had caught fire. There were also traces of fire in other places. Investigators came to the conclusion that the offender attempted to remove his DNA traces by using gasoline. Forensics experts concluded that strangulation was the cause of Vanessa's death. Her battle for survival resulted in the discovery of an unidentified person's DNA under her fingernails. The purpose of the crime was evident due to the removal of Vanessa's garments. In a nutshell, the medical examiners discovered signs of male interaction. After testing the DNA samples, neither the local nor the national databases contained any matches. This kind of crime was extremely unusual for Princeton, a small town with a population of less than 4,000. As a result, it stunned the entire community. In addition to urging everyone to exercise caution and vigilance, the authorities in Princeton and the surrounding areas also requested anyone who witnesses anything unusual to report it to the Princeton Police Department or the Massachusetts State Hotline. At a press conference on August 11th, Worcester District Attorney Joseph Early Jr. acknowledged that the culprit was most likely male and had suffered minor scrapes, bruises and scratches during the battle with Vanessa before her murder. Vanessa's co-workers were as shocked by what had happened to her as her family and the people of Princeton were. According to a Google representative, Vanessa Marcotte was a cherished employee who spent the previous year and a half working in the company's New York office. She was well known for her contagious grin, enthusiasm for volunteer work, and love of Boston sports. Her family and friends are in our thoughts and hearts, and we are shocked and grieved by this. Her former school honored her as well. Boston University's Executive Director of Media Relations, Colin Riley, expressed deep sadness for her family and friends. We are praying and thinking about them. 
At first, investigators looked into a potential link between Vanessa Marcotte's passing and an event in New York City a few days prior involving Karina Vetrano, another runner. Vetrano went for a run in the late afternoon on August 2, 2016, in Queen's Spring Creek Park, less than a block from her house. Despite her father's worries, she ran by herself. Her last known location was shortly before she entered the park, after 5 p.m. Vetrano's father alerted a neighbor and the police chief of the New York City Police Department, who started a search when she did not answer repeated calls and texts. Her father discovered her dead face down, some 15 feet from the route, at around 11 p.m. Similar to Vanessa Marcotte's case, Karina Vetrano's death was caused by strangling, and her body was discovered. Despite their similarities, investigators did not believe there was a link between the two cases. After six months, authorities detained Brooklyn resident Chanel Lewis, 20, after discovering a match between his DNA and Karina Vetrano's remains. Lewis received a life sentence without the chance of release on April 23, 2019. However, who was to blame for Vanessa Marcotte's passing? Investigators believe that the individual who killed Vanessa either frequented or resided in Princeton, and hence, was probably familiar with the area. Additionally, investigators think that Vanessa Marcotte did not know the offender, and their paths simply happened to cross. Meanwhile, law enforcement had established separate 24-hour phone lines for the public, to whom they appealed for assistance once more. Eventually, at about 1 p.m. on August 7th, an eyewitness claimed to have seen Vanessa stop outside a nearby convenience store for a sip of water. She was last spotted strolling and using her phone. After seeing Vanessa outside the business, investigators assumed the incident happened within the next two hours. At 2.11 p.m., she shut off her phone and hasn't turned it on since. When it came to finding the body, police officials were verifying and evaluating a lot of clues, combing the region and adjacent areas multiple times, but their efforts were not producing the expected results. The police did not obtain additional information regarding the case until three months later. A second witness reported that on August 7th, he had observed a dark-colored Ford SUV with the hood up parked on the curb, close to the scene of Vanessa's corpse discovery. It was the driver, a man with a somewhat Hispanic appearance, who appeared to be between 25 and 35 years old. Around 12.45 p.m., the witness saw the SUV for the first time. The motorist was standing beside his car, chatting on the phone. At around 2.05 p.m., the witness drove by the same spot again. The SUV was still in the same position, but it had its hood down, and nobody was in or around it. A Hispanic male who drove a black SUV, and may have resided close to Princeton, was the target of an initial search by the authorities. More than six months after Vanessa's passing, on February 23, 2017, Worcester County District Attorney Joseph Early Jr. provided further information about the inquiry, revealing that a profile had been made and that DNA from Vanessa's body had been sent to a lab. Witness accounts and DNA evidence suggested that the suspect was a medium-height Hispanic man between 20 and 30, with short or shaved hair and an athletic frame. There was also a belief that the suspect had to have obvious injuries to his upper body within days of the attack and that he either owned or had access to a dark-colored SUV on the day of the incident. Three weeks later, a Worcester County police officer on patrol noticed a man who fit the suspect's description. The car this man was operating was the same one on display the day Vanessa Marcotti passed away. In a hurry, the policeman jotted down the license plate number on his hand. Following the identification of the car's owner, the police squad visited his residence. The individual in question was Angelo Colon Ortiz, a 31-year-old. Colon Ortiz was a native of Puerto Rico with no criminal record. He had moved to Worcester less than a year ago, was married, and had three children. He was a third-party contractor for FedEx and performed deliveries inside the municipality of Princeton and its environs. Colon Ortiz's neighbors in Worcester claimed that he was a pervert who frequently said offensive things to locals. Colon Ortiz frequently made offensive remarks about her and other women to his co-worker in Spanish according to a former female postal worker from Princeton. Angelo said he didn't know Vanessa Marcotti when the police questioned him about her. Moreover, he could not remember if he had been in Princeton on Vanessa's attack day. When requested to donate a sample of his DNA, he consented and signed papers saying he would give his DNA for examination. The test took a while to complete, but when it was, Colon Ortiz's DNA matched Vanessa Marcotti's under her fingernails. The individual was taken into custody on April 15, 2017, and charged three days later. According to the prosecution, 
Colon Ortiz allegedly spent $5 on gas on the day of the crime, making the transaction at 2.35 p.m. at a store six miles away from the site. This implied that Vanessa had already passed away by then, and that the man had come back to try to remove his DNA from Vanessa's body, which was the only piece of evidence remaining. The district attorney contended that the prosecution could press charges because the DNA evidence was collected by all legal processes. Colin Ortiz's lawyers, however, asserted that an irregularity occurred while collecting their client's DNA sample. Language barriers hindered their client from completely comprehending that he was not obligated to provide the police a sample of his DNA. Colin Ortiz said he was unaware that he had the option to refuse to do so. Colin Ortiz stated in an affidavit supporting the petition to suppress that although he is a citizen of the United States, he was born in Puerto Rico and is illiterate in English. According to Colin Ortiz, on March 16, 2017, two large white state police officers and another person who spoke a peculiar dialect of Spanish came to my house. After years of prolonged trial, on January 11, 2022, Judge Janet Kenton Walker rejected the defense's request to suppress the DNA evidence. Colin Ortiz entered a plea deal in which he admitted guilt to deprivation of life in the second degree, a felony that carries a lesser punishment, rather than taking a life in the first degree. In addition, he entered a guilty plea to the robbery allegation, for which he faced a 20-year prison term. According to the prosecution, Marcotte's family allegedly accepted the plea deal to avoid a difficult trial. The Marcotte family published a statement through the district attorney's office saying, We are thankful and pleased that the trial ended the way we always wanted it to, that this man will now be in a place where he cannot hurt anyone the way he hurt Vanessa. Marcotte's father said, Let's keep this monster off the streets. I'll be dead long before he gets a parole hearing, Vanessa. The 36-year-old Angelo Colon Ortiz received a life sentence in October 2022. After spending 20 years on the robbery charge, he will start serving a life sentence that will require him to serve at least 25 years before he is eligible for parole. That would mean serving at least 45 years in jail before becoming eligible for parole.